Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art again, and I'm going to continue to read again our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. We're on Chapter 5, Lip Service to the Public Health, and um, I'll save the comments from the peanut gallery from when I'm finished. Page 113, second paragraph. If the public clamor and shock and disbelief is too great, the plowshare proponents of natural gas stimulation are prepared to be even more generous. They will dilute the radioactive gas still further with non-radioactive gas. This also requires translation. At one dilution level, let us suppose piping radioactive gas into the homes of a city of a million people results in, say, 100 or 100 extra cancers plus leukemia per year. If the inhabitant, if the inhabitant object, that is, if they have been warned to object, oh, I see, let me say that again. If the inhabitants object, that is, if they've been warned to object, then the radioactive gas can be split by dilution with equal amounts of non-radioactive gas and distributed to two separate cities, each of a million people. Thereby, the number of cases of cancer plus leukemia in each of the two cities would only be 50 cases. The total number of cancers would still be 100, just as before, but the indignation of the city would be reduced in half. I think they've reduced it down to zero. Or what, maybe like the 100 of us that actually pay attention to it. The peaceful nuclear bomb enthusiasts are quick to point out that this is the old problem of benefits versus risks. Beautiful, but whose benefit and whose risk? The Austral Oil Company recently joined the AEC in one of these nuclear blast gas pro projects in the state of Colorado, looking forward to early commercial exploitation via thousands of underground bomb detonations. Goffman recently suggested to AEC Commissioner Larson, that it appears that the radioactive gas stimulation project of plowshares had a strange type of benefit risk calculation in it. The Austral Oil Company will sell, us unsus will sell unsuspecting customers contaminated radioactive natural gas and thereby derive a monetary profit. This is the benefit side. The consumer will breathe the contaminated gas and a proportion and a certain proportion of the consumers will thereby contract leukemia, cancer, and have children born with genetic deformities and genetically determined diseases. This is the risk side of the equation. How do we balance these? Commissioner Larson felt that this might be an be an extreme view on Goffman's part, and he suggested a more reasonable view. Commissioner Larson suggested thinking of the oil, uh, the Austral Oil Company as the, quote, vehicle, unquote, by which this wonderful new technology was being brought to the American public. Only one thought occurs to us upon listening to this, quote, vehicle, unquote, story. That is a vehicle that if that if that's a vehicle, it is really too bad they ever invented the wheel. Sorry guys, I messed up the joke. Some of the more sober plowshares enthusiasts for natural gas simulation by nuclear bombs speak quite rationally. They say, look, the natural gas reserves are dwindling, and we do as a country need additional sources of supply of natural gas. Nuclear explosives can accomplish this, and we admit there will be some radioactivity, and this will cause some additional deaths, but think of the hazard to society of not having a supply of natural gas. Might not the result be even more deaths and a decrease in the quality of life? Subtitle Let's not leave this decision to Big Brother. This is certainly not an unreasonable set of questions to raise. 
Certainly society one day may choose the lesser of evils in a variety of situations. But who, we may ask, should make such vital decisions for society? A decision which affects the quality of life not only for this generation, but through genetic change in all future generations as well. The Astral Oil Company, El Paso Natural Gas Corporation, the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, the bureaucrats of AEC headquarters. We say emphatically, no. Enough of big brothers deciding what our fate should be. Big brothers in industry and government have already brought us to the sorry environmental plight we're already in. Should we have much confidence in their erudite wisdom to solve problems for us behind our backs in smoke-filled rooms with experts? Such decisions involving accepting a grave risk for some unknown persons in society versus a benefit ostensibly received by some or all members of society represent issues of the highest importance to the public. It should be their decision, arrived at after the fullest disclosure of all the facts relevant to all aspects of the issue, the fullest participation of citizens, scientific or other, in such evaluation, and finally by referendum vote. Even, the, even this leaves much to be desired in view of the fact that a decision is being made to contaminate the planet irrevocably to pollute the genetic inheritance of man for generations to come. But at least this is far superior to Big Brother making the decision, which he so much prefers to do, unhampered by the chill wind of an informed public opinion. Well, folks, I guess that decision was already made, wasn't it? Big Brother's already made the decision for us. The new subtitle. The AEC and its flying road show. Do we see any evidence of a reasonable attitude on the part of the AEC or government with respect to so fundamental an issue in a democratic society? None whatever. Indeed, we have overt evidence that the AEC is going to ram the radioactive natural gas pro program down the throats of the public no matter what they think. This is not our opinion. The record speaks all too clearly for itself. In Colorado, AEC together with Austral Oil, a prospective commercial beneficiary of the natural gas stimulation, launched so-called Project Relucion to determine how much natural gas stimulation they could achieve by underground nuclear blasts. The citizens of Colorado involved the citizens of the Colorado area involved had all kinds of reservations, questions, and objections. Did the AEC fulfill its mission of being responsive to the public health and welfare in that instance? The AEC spends millions of dollars of taxpayers' money in so-called education about the atom. They fly speakers and exhibits everywhere. They indoctrinate school children with exhibits and movies about the wonderful, peaceful Adam. Like, who was that? Disney. Disney. You guys should look that up. The peaceful Adam. Walt Disney did a little cartoon like that. But when the citizens of Colorado feel they may be victimized by an ill-considered AEC project in their very own community, will the AEC sponsor full public debate on all sides of the issues to demonstrate sincerity? Considering the public relations dollars the AEC is freely wasting on propaganda to sing its own praises, surely the cost of an honest rather than one-sided airing of issues before Colorado citizens was indicated. No chance. New subtitle. Colorado citizens feel AEC power. When Colorado citizens finally brought suit to prevent flaring of the radioactive natural gas, did the AEC show itself as the impartial protector of the public health and safety? The most primitive 
elements of compliance with the spirit and letter of the Atomic Energy Act would certainly have required the AEC to assist in every way in the fullest, most open airing of the serious health hazards raised by responsible citizens, citizens and others in the state of Colorado concerning the Relucent Gas Stimulation Project. Did the AEC show such a serious understanding of its obligations of the Atomic Energy Act? They showed precisely the opposite. Arrayed against the meager legal resources of the citizens concerning their concerned with their lives and the prosperity and health, the AEC brought in high-powered legal staff with all the resources of the entire U.S. Solicitor General's office, all at the taxpayer's expense. It is difficult to imagine that what actually was observed was the picture of the AEC, a multi-billion dollar super agency, using the tax dollars of Colorado citizens in an effort to stifle their legitimate rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and in a callous display of contempt for the Colorado citizens, AEC paraded in the bevy of witnesses, all of whom presented a totally irresponsible, one-sided picture of the radiation hazards in question. And this at a time when the controversy concerning hazards of radiation was at its peak. Who paid out of the meager resources to bring a few witnesses to present the other side of the hazard questions? The citizens of Colorado. Arrogance? Could more arrogance in the abuse of power be imagined? This is no isolated instance of the irresponsible manner in which the AEC and its lieutenants treat the serious matter of public health hazards of radiation. Can we say Allison McFarlane? In 1963, we, ag we agreed to investigate comprehensively the health impact of such AEC programs as the Plowshare Program. We were assured that an objective evaluation was desired. It would have been repugnant to us in the extreme to undertake that task at all unless we could evaluate objectively and express our opinion about the Plowshare program. We have worked hard on this and other tasks. Plowshare should be abolished. We conclude that the Plowshare program is not safe for humans nor for the future of the earth. And we say so in no uncertain terms, with plenty of evidence to back our conclusions that this is precisely what we mean about Plowshare. This program would be best abolished in society's interest. But we do not deny anyone else the right to hold or to express contrary opinion. For us to do that would be re reprehensible. Is the Atomic Energy Commission equally reasonable? Fair? Let the record speak on this issue. Dr. John R. Totter. Ooh, Mr. Evil. Dr. John R. Totter is the director of the Division of Biology and Medicine of the AEC. In this position, he, more than any single man in AEC, is responsible for the fullest development and public exposure of information relating to the public health hazard of radiation and AEC programs which can result in exposure of the public to radiation. It is unthinkable on such difficult matters that Dr. Totter would not expect controversies or controversial opinion to arise. But how does Dr. Totter react to any statement of evidence that radiation may be demonstrated to be harmful to man? We have some excellent examples. In 1969, Professor Ernest Sternglass, who recently died, that's kind of sad. In 1969, Professor Ernest Sternglass of the University of Pittsburgh published a paper suggesting that radioactive fallout from weapons testing during the 1950s might have caused as many as 400,000 infant and fetal deaths. 
His manuscript was calculate, was circulated to all of the atomic energy supported biomedical laboratories. Tamplin analyzed Dr. Sternglass's paper and felt that it was not that it was not likely that 400,000 deaths could be attributed to the fallout. Rather, it appeared that poverty in the United States was more a likely explanation. However, reason Tamplin, Dr. Sternglass was served a, has served a very useful social function in raising the question of the real cost of radioactivity spread throughout the earth from weapons testing. He made the calculations himself and concluded that 4,000 infant and fetal, fetal deaths were more likely due to fallout than 400,000. And he prepared a paper for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists presenting his estimate of 4,000 deaths versus Sternglass's estimate of 400,000. Surely, Tamplin thought, it made no sense to criticize Dr. Sternglass's estimate without presenting a countermeasure of his own. I'm going to stop here. We're at 16 minutes. Uh, the next subtitle is called an unusual suggestion from Professor Teller, which I want to wait because I like reading about Mr. Evil himself. So um, I'll stop here. Anyways, um, I want to thank all of my subscribers for listening to this. And I really make an effort, excuse me, I really make an effort to read so that you can understand it. It's the first time I don't read it ahead of time. So every time I read, it's the first time I'm reading it, which is... Why I'm often shocked at what I'm reading. And um, I just want to tell everybody out there, thank you for listening to this book and getting the information and being actively engaged. Evidently, there isn't jack shit we're going to be able to do about it because the program's been set. They don't care if they kill us all. Uh, so I guess our, our thing is this. Love is greater than fear, and we just have to decide to be in love with life and love our own lives and love the people in our lives and love, love, love. Let's just talk about love. And, um, you know, I do tapping. That helps me. I don't know what helps other people, but I, I like tapping. I think tapping helps ground me. Um, but whatever works, it's very important for us not to, to get discouraged because we're coming on to hard times. The shit's about to hit the fan probably very soon. Um, anyways, I'm going to keep on and I appreciate all of you guys. Put your courage feet on. What do they say? Gird your loins, put your courage feet on, walk in love, you know, all that Bible stuff, but it's really important. We can't say it enough. We need to walk in love. We need to walk in integrity. We need to be there for humanity. We need to rediscover what integrity means, ethics. And we got to prepare. Hope you have some water saved up. Anyways, ciao you guys.